Good evening. On the 14th of February, 1980, a very important unmanned astronomical satellite was launched. Its official name is the Solar Maximum Mission, but I think everyone calls it Solar Max. It was sent up, obviously, to study the sun, and it was sent up at that particular moment because the sun was then at the peak of its cycle of activity, and there were plenty of the dark sunspots and plenty of the bright eruptions that we call flares. And so for the first time, astronomers had a whole battery of instruments operating above the atmosphere to study the sun at its most active. And remember, Solar Max was going around the Earth at a height of something like 300 miles under perfect conditions. It was also taking observations in X-ray and gamma rays. Well, for nine months, all went well. And then, sadly, things went wrong. And Solar Max lost its attitude control. That meant that it couldn't be pointed in the right direction. And of course, if you can't point a satellite in the right direction, you lose your information. So Solar Max was operating at very reduced efficiency. What was to be done? Was a running repair possible? And American scientists came to the conclusion that it was. It should be possible to send up a space shuttle, actually go over to Solar Max, bring it into the bay of the shuttle, repair it, and relaunch it. And this has actually been carried out, although not without a great deal of difficulty, I may say. The first attempt ended in failure. And there we see astronaut Nelson actually going across in free flight, untethered, from the shuttle to Solar Max to try and stop it spinning because the satellite was rotating, and of course that made it almost impossible to get into the bay. The spin had to be stopped first. But when astronaut Nelson tried to do that, he only made the spin worse. And for some time it looked very much as though the entire thing was going to end in failure. But then the spin was controlled by remote control from Earth, and finally Solar Max was literally hooked on the end of a grapple and drawn down into the bay of the shuttle. And when it was there, then it could of course be repaired. And that again was no easy matter. And I think one of the astronauts said it was rather like trying to carry out a delicate surgical operation wearing boxing gloves. And there we actually see Solar Max in the bay, and there it is preparatory to being relaunched. Well, it was relaunched, and it's now back in its path, and it's operating perfectly. And with any luck, it'll go on for some years. So um, although we are now coming on to a solar minimum period, Solar Max should go on operating until we have the next Solar Maximum around about 1990. It really has been a tremendous space triumph. But before we say more about that, let's have a quick look at the sun itself. Now, the sun is a star, a perfectly ordinary star, 93 million miles away from us, and big enough to swallow up a million globes the size of the Earth. Of course, it's very hot, and it's creating its energy by what we call nuclear transformations. And the powerhouse of the sun is deep in the center, in this cross section that's indicated there by the white part, and that's where the energy is being produced. Uh, and I may say the sun is losing mass, or weight if you like, at the weight of something like four million tons a second. But uh, please don't get alarmed because there's plenty left and the sun won't change much for at least 5,000 million years in the future. Now we can't see straight into the sun. What we can do is to study the photosphere, which is the sun's bright surface. And on that we see sunspots. Sometimes there are plenty of them, sometimes there are not. The sun is to some extent a variable star with this 11 year period. And when that picture was taken, the sun was near the minimum of its cycle of activity. And you can see there are just two spots, not very far from the center of the disk, uh, both of which are rather bigger than the Earth, I may say. On the other hand, when the sun is active, you see plenty of spot groups. And if you look down there to the lower left, you will also see bright areas, which we call faculae. And those may be regarded as bright clouds lying above the photosphere itself. Incidentally, the spots are not really dark. They only look so because they're about 2,000 degrees cooler than the bright background. If you could see them shining on their own, their surface brilliancy would be greater than that of an arc lamp. Well, what about the sun at present? I make daily observations of the sun, and this was one that I made uh, on April the 24th with my five-inch refracting telescope. And there you can see a very large group coming over the limb. I may say much larger than one would expect at the present stage when we're well past the last solar maximum of 1980 and I'm not coming up to the next one. Uh, just two points about that. I say that I made that drawing with my telescope. I do not, of course, mean that I look straight at the sun. That's a fatal thing to do. You must never look straight at the sun through any telescope or binoculars, even if you use a dark filter. You're certain to do permanent damage to your eye. The only sensible way is to use the telescope as a projector, point it at the sun without looking through it, and then project the sun's image onto a screen held behind the eyepiece. That's the only sensible way to do it. And also, just in passing, on the evening of May the 30th this year, there's going to be a partial eclipse of the sun when the moon will pass in front of the sun and partly hide it. And again, remember not to look at that through a telescope or binoculars because the eclipsed sun is just as dangerous as the uneclipsed sun.
But let's come back now to this all-important solar cycle, which was one of the main reasons for sending up solar max satellites. If we look at the plot of the solar activity going back over the centuries, I think you'll see what I mean. Uh, I agree that over to the left-hand side, there's a period before 1700 when there were virtually no spots at all, so far as we can tell from the old records, and we don't really understand that. But since then, the cycle has been fairly regular. Some peaks are higher than others, some are very high indeed. And we can predict what the sun is going to do. And when the sun is active, we have the spots, and we have those all-important flares. And Solar Max was time to study those. Now, I'm not really a solar observer, so I'm delighted to welcome back somebody who is, Dr. Simon Mitten. Welcome back, Simon. Hello again, Patrick. Well, Solar Max is now operating again. What do you think are some of the main problems facing it? You already touched on one of those, and that is the cause of the solar cycle and the magnetic activity that goes with it. That sunspot cycle is intimately linked, for sure, with another problem, which is exactly how the gas is moving below the solar photosphere and how it's interacting with the magnetic field there. And then there are also problems in the outer layers of the sun. We would like to know how they are heated up. When an eclipse of the sun takes place, observers on the ground have the opportunity to see those outer layers as the moon blots out the main disk of the sun. And we can see the chromosphere, which is very close to the surface of the sun, and then the corona, which can sometimes extend out to several solar radii. It's in the chromosphere of the sun that one can most readily see during an eclipse the beautiful phenomena known as prominences. Here for example is one which is extending out to perhaps three earth diameters above the photosphere of the sun. These prominences are always there. You don't need an eclipse in order to see them. It's just that that's the time that the phenomenon shows up in the most beautiful way. Although of course you can't see them with ordinary telescopes. No, and in fact the solar maximum satellite and the Skylab we're able to see these prominences, and here, for example, is another example of a prominence which has been pictured from space. Now, these prominences are working their way up towards the corona, and it's there that we encounter some real puzzles. X-ray pictures of the sun show us that the temperature of the corona is about a million degrees, and indeed, in an X-ray image in false color, such as this one, you're able to see a number of very bright points of energetic activity where the temperature may be as much as two million degrees. That very high temperature often leads people to think, golly, shouldn't I be able to see that all the time? Why do I have to wait for an eclipse? There are two reasons for that. One is that most of the emission from such a hot body is in X-rays and not visible light anyway. And secondly, there isn't very much matter around. One's got to draw the distinction between temperature, which is measuring how much matter is rushing around, and the amount of heat which you would perceive were you there, and that's related to how much matter there is. So in the corona, where the temperature is very, very high, I mean millions of degrees, there's virtually no heat at all? No, there isn't. Uh, just that very, very high temperature and particles rush rushing around at tremendously high speeds. But let's just review the temperature structure of the sun. As, as we know, you start with 14 million degrees in the deep interior where there's a nuclear furnace, and then work your way up to the photosphere and the temperature is steadily dropping all the time until we reach 6,000 degrees at the photosphere. Above that, the chromosphere, which is 4,000 to 10,000 degrees, and then the corona, which has this temperature of about a million or a million and a half. And that just seems to defy common sense, because you would think that as you went further out from the sun, you would encounter lower and lower temperatures. And clearly, there is something going on in the chromosphere and the lower corona something related to solar activity probably, which is heating it up to that high temperature. We've already mentioned as well prominences and flares, and I'd just like to draw a distinction between these two. Prominences are actually there much of the time. They are beautiful phenomena, not particularly energetic. What you're mainly looking at is differences in temperature in the chromosphere. A flare is altogether a different order of magnitude in terms of its energetic activity. It's a very, very um, violent uh, discharge of activity which is taking place in the chromosphere coronal regions. This is an example of the kind of data which the Solar Maximum satellite was able to send before it packed in in 1980, and that very bright region there is a region in which a flare is taking place. At some observatories, for example, the Big Bear Solar Observatory in California, they do monitor the flares by looking at the emission from the sun in a very, very narrow band of visible light. And here is a flare imaged in, actually, red light. Uh, 
the flare is the whitish area shown on the left. I should also mention that if you're observing the sun in the responsible way you just outlined by projection, you aren't going to see any flares in fact. Um, the flare itself, which they're often associated with um, sunspots, and uh, here is a bird's eye view which shows a flare poised over a sunspot, you're not actually going to see that in white light. Generally speaking, you need special instruments, unless you're very, very lucky, as Carrington was when he discovered these in 1859. Well, I've been looking at the sun for some time with my telescopes, and I've certainly never seen a flare in ordinary light, and frankly, I don't expect to. I don't suppose that more than one serious solar observer in 10,000 ever have. But of course, with modern instruments, we can study them at any time. And they are very important, I mean, usually associated with spot groups, but they send out radiations and emissions of all kinds, and uh, they could be damaging, of course, to astronauts. And we've got to remember that during the Solar Max rescue, uh, astronaut Nelson was actually free flying between the shuttle and uh, Solar Max. So it's an awfully good idea to know when the these flares are likely to occur, even though obviously we can't predict any particular flare. And then there are the spectacular results too. The uh, particles cross the 93 million mile gap, enter the Earth's upper atmosphere, and produce those lovely glows that we call the polar lights of aurorae. And there's a lovely display of aurora seen from Scotland at the time of the last solar maximum. Well, now that the sun's coming down to a quiet period, we can't expect so many aurorae, although this very energetic group now coming over could, I suppose, produce an auroral display not down in South England, I think, but it's worth looking out if you're living in North Scotland. Everything we've discussed so far, of course, can really be boiled down to one problem. We've got mm. the flares, the aurorae, the activity. What we really want to understand is the solar activity and its causes. And its solar max, with all of its special instruments for looking in the non-visible radiations and also looking at the corona, that's what the experiment was all about. Yes, and of course our observations of the corona from, the, from Earth are limited to times of total eclipse, and that doesn't happen very often. And we also know that the corona is not the same when the sun is active as it is when the sun's inactive. Well, I've, I'm lucky, I've seen about five total eclipses, and when the sun is at the minimum of its cycle of activity, with not very many spots and flares around, the corona is fairly restricted, rather like that. But if you're lucky enough to see a maximum type corona when the sun is really active, then the sight is really superb. The corona is much brighter, it's more symmetrical, and you get these uh, streamers going right across the sky. And it really is a most magnificent sight. Such a pity that from England we have to wait until the 11th of August 1999 for our next total eclipse. The Solar Maximum satellite, of course, had a special instrument called a coronagraph on board, which enabled them to see the corona at all times. That it, that's a telescope that has a disc inside it which blocks out the main image and enables you just to follow the much fainter phenomena going on in the corona, such as this wonderful great surge of particles being thrust millions of miles into space. And that again is one of the images which was made in 1980. It was also possible from the first phase of the mission to study the temperature structure, here again in false color. We see uh, something that's very, very uh, complicated um, loops of stuff rushing out into the corona and giving a rather messy picture of the temperature structure. Then there is the magnetism and the structure of the magnetic field. And this is one of my favorite solar maximum images. It shows uh, in the 11 o'clock position there above the surface of the sun a pinkish structure which is a kind of magnetic arcade permeating the lower corona. And quite a lot of these have been seen. People think that what may be going on is that these magnetic arcades sometimes collide very violently, and that results in the release of superheated gas, which results in the flaring activity. And still on the uh, magnetic field, it's also been possible to see what that's like around the regions of the sun's pole. And in this color-coded image, we see a reddish and black color going right down to the surface of the sun. And what that's telling us is that that part of the corona is cool, and there isn't a lot of activity. So those are some of the very exciting results which came from the first part of the Solar Maximum mission. Now, theoretical astronomers are actually still looking at all mm. that stuff, even though it was three years ago, because the mathematical techniques which are necessary to handle these problems are very hairy indeed. Well, it's all bound up after all with magnetism, and we've known ever since 1908 that the sunspots themselves are centers of magnetic, ma magnetic activity. And I think it really boils down to a large extent to the fact that the sun does not rotate in the way that a solid body would do. Uh, the average rotation period of the sun is rather less than a month, which is why from day to day, if you're following the sunspots, you can see them carried across from one side of the disk to another.
But the equatorial part of the sun, that's the middle, rotates much more quickly than the polar regions. And that causes tanglings in the magnetic lines of force, which eventually produces the sunspots as magnetic phenomena. We can, in fact, see the effects of that, indeed, at the Kitt Peak National Observatory in Arizona, where they follow the sun on a continuing basis, using the great solar telescope there. They're able to make images of the sun more or less whenever they please, because it's not very often cloudy in Arizona. <laughs> and here you see a lovely color-coded picture of a sunspot group. The sunspot is coded in the yellow and pinkish magenta coloring, yellow where the magnetic field is coming out, pinkish where it's going back in, and it's not terribly difficult to imagine that there are two loops of flux there connecting the two. You know, there are indications also that the real solar cycle is probably not 11 years at all, but 22, because the things return to their original magnetic state after 22 years. But I know another point here that everyone I think is interested in. What about sunspot cycles and the weather? Because I can remember the time, only a few decades ago, when it was thought quite definite that the weather uh, depended upon the state of activity on the sun. I'm not talking now about electrical storms, magnetic storms. I'm talking about the actual weather. But um, nowadays, people are not quite so certain. It's all a bit of a muddle, actually, Patrick. I'm one of the people who thinks that there probably is evidence now that we've got a link between the weather we observe on Earth and the cycle of solar activity. Let me give you some examples of what I mean. Rainfall, for example. The rainfall measured at Hobart, Tasmania, is plotted here as just small deviations, up to 25 millimetres, from the average. And we see how the peak of the rainfall is occurring with the peak of the solar cycle, which is coded there as a series of arrows. And then again, the rings in trees tell you what the climate was like in the past, and we see the 11-year cycle in that. And there's been some remarkable evidence thrown up by geologists who have shown that lake deposits 700 million years old also have this 11-year cycle locked into it. And this must be telling us that the, sol the cycle of solar activity is pretty constant. Can we be sure that over a longer period of time, the sun sends out exactly the same amount of energy? I don't believe we can. Well, that's another thing that the Solar Maximum mission was designed to look at. Astronomers talk about something called the solar constant. We can define that as how much energy is the sun sending us minute by minute. They call it the constant in the last century when they hadn't got precise instruments. But Solar Max has got a precise instrument and it is able to measure very small deviations from the norm. And we see that plotted here during 1980 and the deviations it found were only around one-tenth of one percent. Now, you might think that that's not very much at all, it's certainly much less than when a cloud goes in front of the sun, but nevertheless, it does raise an interesting question. If we can measure deviations like that on an hour-to-hour -hour basis, uh, what happens over a period of a few years? And that's where Solar Max comes in again, and it will be very interesting indeed to see the 1984 data. It will indeed. And I think you'll agree that although the sun is so near to us on the astronomical scale, the only star we can examine in detail, there's still a great deal about it that we don't know. And Solar Max may help us to find out a lot more. Simon, thank you very much. So it's good to know that Solar Max is now in full working order again. With any luck, it'll go on functioning throughout the period of solar minimum now ahead of us and through into the next solar maximum of 1990, 1991. And it won't be alone, because it's going to be joined by other probes. There's going to be the Solar Orbital Telescope, with a 48-inch mirror that will monitor the sun continuously from above the atmosphere. And also the Solar Polar Mission, which will go right above the ecliptic and study those regions that have never been properly accessible before. But in all these investigations, Solar Max is a very valuable part. It's a kind of missing link. So indeed, it's very good to know that it has been repaired and will be able to play a full part. So the rescue has been very much worthwhile. And so from Simon and myself, good night.